All right, welcome to week four. I think this is week four. Um, or at least the second half of lecture four. And we're going to be picking up where I left off last week, and the topic is normalization. And, of course, it's ignoring my clicks. So data normalization is a tool. Not a tool like a wrench or a tool like a piece of software. It's a technique. And the purpose is to improve the logical design of a database and to make sure that the structure is valid. Um, and the absolute, if you're going to explain normalization in one sense, is you're trying to design a database that avoids unnecessary duplication of data. If you need to touch a piece of data, you shouldn't have to touch it in more than one place. And it's also known as the process of decomposing relations. In other words, you're going to take existing entities and uh, entities and you're going to break them down into the smallest pieces that make sense that are structured well. So that's your, your goal. Now, a well-structured relation, it's a relation that contains minimal data redundancy. In other words, again, I'm trying to avoid repeated data and redundancy. And when you are actually doing data operations on it, which is, you know, you're adding, removing, or changing data, you're not going to suddenly cause inconsistency in your system. So the end goal is to avoid anomalies. And there's three kinds of anomalies you get with database structures. Uh, the first one's an insertion anomaly. So when you add a new row, you have to create duplicated data. So if you have to create duplicated data, there's something wrong. Pretty straightforward concept. A deletion anomaly is if you delete a piece of information out of the database and for some unknown reason, something else goes away that you need to keep. So, for example, you want to change, you know, let's say you got a piece of broken furniture and to, in your house and you want to throw out that piece of broken furniture. So instead of, you know, taking that nice piece of broken furniture and carrying it out and putting it on the side of the curb, you set your living room on fire. That got rid of that furniture, but you also got rid probably of the rest of the furniture and probably part of your house. That's a deletion anomaly. When, you, when stuff gets de destroyed, that's not supposed to get destroyed. And a modification anomaly means if you change data in one row, you end up having to change it in more than one place. That's bad because something could go wrong while the whole thing is happening and you'll have inconsistent data. So those are the three anomalies that you have to try to avoid. Now, I've got a sample table, and we're going to be using the sample table for the rest of this. Um, but here's a three examples of those anomalies. An insertion, insertion anomaly. You can't add a new employee unless the employee has taken a class. And in this case, Lorenzo Davies didn't take a class, so he's the one person in the entire database that's allowed to be added without a class because he got in there first. Therefore, we can't leave those fields empty for anybody else. Uh, deletion. If we remove employee 140, which is Alan Beaton, uh, as a third from the top, uh, we will lose information. For example, we'll lose the fact that an accounting department ever existed. We'll also lose the fact that they took tax accounting and that the course tax accounting ever existed in the system. That's a deletion anomaly. So if we delete, we fire Alan Beaton, we suddenly no longer have an accounting department. Period. The system doesn't even know it ever existed. And a modification anomaly, if employee number 100, Margaret Simpson, gets a raise, we have to give her her raise in two different places. That's just begging for something to go wrong. Um, nowadays, most computers are fast enough that the odds of it going wrong are pretty small. But there once was a time where computers weren't very fast and, you know, the tape is moving, the tape breaks going way back in the day. That's the easy way to explain it. Uh, for those of us that actually have had cassette tapes, we've had the experience where the tape just breaks and you end up having to tape your tape. And if we update Margaret Simpson and her salary becomes 49000 and we change the first row and then something goes wrong with the computer system and the second row never gets updated, how do we know what her right salary is? Is it 48000 Is it 49000 We don't know. It's now in an in inconsistent state because all these values no longer match. 
So those are anomalies. We don't want that as much as humanly possible. So this is the process of normalization. We only worry about the stuff on the left. Uh, this course pretty much ends with the stuff on the left and there's a vague description about the Boyce cod. So there's three normal forms and to be in first normal form, which I'll be talking about in a minute, uh, these are the different steps. You remove multi-valued attributes, I'll explain what those are in a minute. Then you're in first normal form, you remove partial dependencies, you're in second, get rid of transitives, now you're in third. And at this point, technically, you have a well-designed database. Uh, the next form takes care of some weird edge cases, and after that, it's almost all academic. Uh, by academic, I mean literally fourth, fifth, sixth normal forms are pretty much used only in academia. They never, you almost never see them used in the real world. So, before I get into the process a little bit more, there's a bit of terminology because, you know, what's a database class without some terminology? A functional dependency. The value of one attribute is known as the determinant, determines the value of another attribute. So for example, here at the school, your student number is your determinant and they can use the determinant to determine your name. Your name is identified by your student number, thus your name is determined by your student number. And I'm going to be smart, I'm going to shut the door before. I have to give anybody there. You'd think I'd learn by now, eh? It's only been four weeks. Okay, so, so I described what a functional dependency is. A candidate key is a unique identifier. I covered that two weeks ago and last week. And one of the candidate keys will become a primary key. Um, and then here's an example, a credit card number or a social security number in a table. They're both candidate keys. And if, by the way, if you've got somebody's social security number and their credit card number in the, da in the same database, your tool, don't do that. It's not something you should be doing unless you work for a bank. Um, and each non-key field is functionally dependent on the, every candidate key. So essentially, Anything that's not part of the key has to be dependent on the key. And those are the two terminologies. So for the rest of this, I'm going to use this invoice for the rest of the examples, for the rest of these slides. And by the way, currently, this is not a valid relation. So also known as not as a valid table or a set of entities. And I'll show you guys why. Now, there's, the good news is this was already, the candidate keys have already been identified. We have order ID and product ID. And they decided that this was going to be the candidate keys and it's a compound key. Great. They took care of that step for you. So usually you have to figure this one out on your own. The reason why it's not a valid relation is, if you look here, this is a full row of data, but these two aren't full rows of data, and this one's not a full row of data. This is what's known as a multi-valued attribute. So there's multiple values per. So to go into the first normal form, we want no multi-valued attributes. And every attribute values atomics. In other words, it's self-contained. The figure has now been put in the first normal form. And how did I put it in first normal form? I literally took this chunk and copied it three times down. And again, this one here, I took this chunk and I copied it again once more down so that each row is fully contained onto itself. You can see right here 106, 106 going all the way across and all the things that belong to that order. And 107, all the stuff that belongs to that order. At this point, the candidate keys have been defined and there's no multi-valued attributes. And at this point in time, what they meant by multi-valued attribute was Literally every single order line was treated as a single attribute that had multiple values in it. So by exploding it out so that the whole row is defined, it's no longer got multi-valued attributes because they're all self-contained. So when it's time to write a, answer questions on an exam and it asks you what is the definition of first normal form, it is there are no multi-valued attributes and the candidate keys have been defined. 
Actually, I'll be providing you guys with a cheat sheet of those possible ways of wording this. Now, as it stands, there's still some insertion, there's still anomalies. Um, if a new product is ordered for order with number 107, existing data must be re-entered, causing duplication. If we look at it down here, you can see that 107 is duplicated. And if I add another line, I got to copy down uh, the customer ID and the customer information for every time I want to add something. Deletion. If I delete the dining room table from order 106, right there, we are going to lose the product finish. That means we won't even know whether uh, natural ash was an option for our furniture. And the update anomaly, if we change the price of product number four, you can see product number four is in here twice. If we change it, we have to change the price in two places. Can you imagine if at Loblaws you had to change the price for everything in more than one place with their thousands of products that they sell? It'd be terrible. So why does this exist? Why are there anomalies? It's because there's multiple entity types inside that diagram or that table. And if we look in here, there's three entity types. There's orders, there's customer information, and then there's product information. And those, basically those are the entity types. So now we're going to describe what second normal form is. Second normal form is you have to be in first normal form before you can be in second normal form. It's sort of how you have to be a Saiyan before you become a Super Saiyan. It's impossible to become a Super Saiyan unless you're a Saiyan first. That's just how it is. No, I hate that, uh, that anime, by the way. Every non-key attribute is fully functionally dependent on the entire primary key. So anything that's not part of the key has to be dependent on the entire key. Which is basically what the two lines are saying, just different wording for the exact same thing. And there's no partial functional dependencies. Now, here's a diagram that shows how all the dependencies are behaving. So the full dependencies are as follows. You got the order ID, the order, the order quantity right here is fully dependent on the product ID and the order ID. In other words, on this order, that product, that many were ordered, but nothing else is dependent completely on that key. So then we have a partial dependency. The price, the finish, and the description is dependent only on the product ID. It has nothing to do with the quantity. It has nothing to do with the order number. So basically, the description of the product is only dependent on the product ID. So they call that a partial dependency. Those attributes are only, they're only defined by part of the candidate keys, which right now is order ID and product ID. These guys are only defined by this one. And over here, we have another partial dependency where the order date and all the customer information is partially dependent on the order ID. The order date has nothing to do with the product. Therefore, the order date has nothing to do with the product ID. And later on, I'll be talking about tra the transitive dependency. The customer information is only dependent on the ca customer ID, but it's not part of the candidate key or the primary keys. Therefore, we don't worry about it at this stage, but it's known as a transitive. So when, if we were going to grab this, this is the breakdown. If I can find my mouse. The order ID is in charge of the order date, the customer ID, customer name, and address. The customer ID is in charge of the customer name and the customer address. The product ID is in charge of the description, the finish, and the price. And the actual full primary key has a dependency of the order quantity, and that's it. So we went from o to what we had before to this. So these are the relations or the entity types that are contained in there with their matching attributes. So how do you get rid of the partial dependencies? We break them out into their own entities. So before, when we had this, everything was part of one row of data, one long block of data. And that's not workable, so how do you, what do you do? So you look at this stuff here, and this tells you what it should look like. Suddenly now we have three entities. And we have 
the order line entity, which has the order ID and the product ID and the quantity that was ordered. We have a products or a product table, which has product ID and the applicable stuff, the description, the finish, and the price. And then we have the order information, which is the customer order, which has the order ID and the customer's information. So now we have some transitive dependencies. The customer address and customer name depends on the customer ID, just like your student number determines your name and your courses and stuff here. The customer name has nothing to do with the order date. It has nothing to do with the order at all. It has nothing to do with it whatsoever. So those are known as transitive dependencies. In other words, if you, can, if you have to say something like the customer's name is determined by the customer ID and the customer ID is determined by the order ID, that's a transitive. If you have to jump twice to get to the candidate keys or the primary keys, if there's two, two or more jumps, those are transitives. That's basically how you figure out if something's a transitive. So we got rid of the partials. We still have a transitive left behind. So the third normal form is you must be in second normal form. See my previous comment about Dragon Ball Z. If you're not in second normal form, it's impossible to, be, impossible to be in third normal form. That means you miss steps. There must be no transitive dependencies. And again, you can't have this situation here. Because you'll still have to edit the customer's name in more than one place. So this is called transitive because the primary key is a determinant for another attribute, which in turn is a determinant for another attribute. Right? So second I talked about earlier, if you have to do more than one jump to get to the primary key of the table, it's a transitive. The answer is take that shit and put it in its own box. It's pretty straightforward. You literally grab it and you put it somewhere else. So you do something like this, where originally we had this setup where we had the order ID, the order date, and the customer ID, and then you have the customer ID, customer name, customer address. You create a customer table that has a customer ID, and an order table, which has the order information in it. And you basically, the customer ID in this table is a foreign key that points to the primary key of this table. And suddenly we have our tables that have been broken out. There's no more transitives. So now you end up something that looks like this when you're done. This is a logical diagram. You guys have been playing in PG Modeler now for a couple of weeks. The only difference between what you see here and what you see in PG Modeler is there's no data types. So that's, that's a logical diagram. The difference between a logical and a physical diagram is the physical diagram has data types. The logical one does not. Literally the difference. They're identical. And when you look at this, you'll see the customer is defined, customer name, customer address. All the customer information is self-contained. If you need to change a person's name or change their address, you only need to do it in one place. You don't need to go and mess with an order to change somebody's name or change their shipping address. Same thing with the product. You've got the product description and the finish and the standard price. And if I need to change the description of that, that's fine to change it in one place. I don't need to change every order line to say that, you know, this table's now not available in ASH. And when you see the order, in here, all there is is the order ID that uniquely identifies the order. There's a foreign key that identifies that this order belongs to a given customer. And then the date of the order. And the product and the order come together to create an order line which is the stuff that was bought. And essentially all that's left on here is the quantity. So customer A bought three of product Z. And that's third normal form. So that's the official description of what the normal forms are. Covered fairly quickly. Um, but essentially the hardest part of understanding is the following definitions is knowing that you can't go to higher normal form unless you're already in the previous normal form. So one to two to three. After three, there's something called Boyce Cod. Um, Boyce Cod is also known as in the industry, except for in academia, because people that are, that all they do is teach get upset when you call Boyce Cod normal form three and a half, because it's somewhere between normal form three and normal form four. So what else can it be but three and a half? It's just a set of edge case rules. 
To be in first normal form, everything, it, there must be a candidate key defined and there are no multi-valued attributes. Second normal form, there's no uh, partial dependencies. Third normal form, there's no transitives. That's literally the definitions of um, normal, the three forms of normalization. One more time, would you like me to write it out? Okay, first normal form. Candidate keys are defined. No multi-valued attributes. That's the rule for first normal form. Second normal form must be in first normal form. And there's no personal dependencies. Third normal form must be in second normal form. No transitive dependencies. And that is the official description of the first three normal forms. Um, I've seen profs cover two lectures on this. The, the reason I don't spend as much time on it as others is one, odds are when you come out of here, you're gonna not be creating databases from scratch from 100 year old data. And B, I'm trying to teach you guys to design to the third normal form right off the bat. And you're going to use those rules as a way to just make sure your design is sane. So you understand what the rules are. So your design is sane. You don't necessarily need to go through all these steps if you do it right. Put it in two places. Because it's by foreign keys. The foreign keys that looks up the values. Um, I got to put a caveat on what you just said. You should never have to enter the same data twice in the same system. Right? Got to be careful because if it's unrelated, for example, for the college, there's access. And the access exists for, for staff and for students, by the way. We got our own little version of access. And the payroll system, they put us in both places separately. They're two different systems, but they've got to maintain them independently. Apparently, they're going to fix it eventually that they're interlinked. But for example, the HR system is not connected to Access. And Brightspace isn't really connected to Access. They do an export out of, Brights out of Access like once a day to update Access on whether or not you should be in my class. They're not connected directly. So technically, the data is being inputted into Brightspace from an export from Access. So the data exists in more than one place, but they're not the same system. They're independent systems. So that, so that's the caveat, right? So when you're entering data into a single system, you should never have to enter the same stuff twice. So for example, imagine if you went to Amazon and you had to actually type in every single time you ordered your address. And they had like 25 copies of your address. And every time you place an order, you have to put it in over and over again. Then you got to change your address and you got to go and they got to go and change every copy of your address. It's a little absurd. Old systems were like that because servo and actually uh, denormalized. And there is something called denormalization. Um, and I swear to God, I used to have a slide at the end of this. I talked about it and I guess I deleted it. Um, denormalization is when you take something that is properly normalized and then you break it a little bit. Um, for performance reasons, usually. Uh, because when, it's, when a database is really well normalized and it's under a heavy load, sometimes there's so many interconnections that the whole thing slows down. Too many moving parts, so to speak. Um, often, the most common target for denormalization is when you um, set up data for reporting. So for example, at the end of the night, Amazon will run a summary of the daily sales. And they won't talk about how I bought three boxes of cat litter and ordered two packs of shit tickets. Toilet paper, sorry. Right, I didn't, I forgot to order these things. It's a roll, it comes off like tickets. That's a really old joke, but anyways. Um, they don't care about that, but they may care about how many boxes of cat litter were sold total. 
So what they'll do is at the end of the night, they, they run summary rollups and then they'll store that data denormalized in another database. That's like what they call a denormalization target where you take the, the well-designed structure and you make a copy of it that's not as good, but it'll be fast to report on because you don't have to constantly connect everything. So those are the targets for uh, normal denormalization. Actually, I will be talking about more about it later. Now, so that was the fun part of the lecture. Here comes the exciting part of the lecture. Yes, it should be up and visible. Okay. Which one do you want me to talk about first, the test or the assignment? Okay, let's get the test out of the way. All right, under content, it, it's online. Okay, test one is live. Test one, I do tests a little differently than the other teachers. Why? Because I hate wasting class time for tests. So the way my tests are set up is they're take home tests. You got a week to do it. However, not all the answers will be found in the slides. It will expects you to actually understand the material a little bit so you can actually look for answers here, there, and everywhere. It's a re what I call a, I like to call a research test. The answers are all out there and the content is all around. It can all be found. It's not impossible and it's not insane. Yes. I'll explain that in a second. Now, so there's, you take it home, you do it, you can save, you can resume. The only thing I ask is you guys try to be honest and not sit with your friends in a circle and do the test together. This should be your individual effort. Yes, I can guarantee 20% of you will still sit together on Discord and pass the answers around. Just saying, I know. Thanks for the link, by the way, because I have a Discord account too. So I get, to watch the, I get to watch the Discord for this group as a whole. Yeah, well, the thing is, is uh, usually what I do is I end up watching uh, the Discords during tests and stuff. And if I see answers being floated around, I randomly pick people to fail. But I don't know who it is. Unless you're dumb and you actually use your real name. But I'm just saying, I'm not allowed to do that. But, you know, I will make the next test in class on paper. So don't do that. You're going to ruin it for everyone else, including me. Um, now, to answer your question, the test started, was available at 6 o'clock today. It is officially due, actually it started at 7, because I didn't want you guys to be able to start while I was lecturing. It is due, I hate the way this starts, the start date's after the due date. It is due next week at 6. At the start of the class. It is, it ends on the 15th, as in I give you guys a one week grace period to do it with a 10% penalty. It shows me if you did it late. Now if you're like one minute late, five minutes late submitting, I'm not going to care. If you submit it like 24 hours late, yeah, I care. Things happen, people's computers die. Or as a student in my class, I just came from, as they were walking out the door, somebody slammed the door as he walked out and caught the lid of his laptop in the door. Guess what he was buying tonight? New laptop for him. I actually heard the, the plastic hit the floor, like chunks of plastic right in the floor. I said, I hope you get that guy's no money out of him. <laughs> the guy did it to you. So there's the test. So that means you got one week to do it. It's due next Tuesday at six o'clock, that means you've got all week to do it. It's not impossible, it's like, I don't remember, it's like 40 questions. It's not absurd. It covers everything we covered as of today. So as soon as I finish the normalization, the talk about normalization, that's what's on the test up to that point. Those slides, any of the booklets you might see, it's all fair game. And then on the 15th, at six o'clock, the test goes away. If you haven't submitted, TFB. If you don't know what that means, ask the person next to you who probably knows what that means. There we go. There's always someone that'll say it for me. 
So now to talk about the assignment. All right, now the assignment is group. That is your midterm. That's why I ask you is not to set it as a group and do it. Try to do it on your own effort. That's your midterm. That is your test. I give you guys an entire week to do your midterm. How much more could you ask for? After. I don't need it on camera. So there's the test. Now, assignment one. Assignment one is group work. Why? Because on the course outline, it says you must do at least one piece of group work in this course. Sorry, guys, this is it. And I feel about group work as much as well. I love it as much as you guys do. Now, groups of three if possible. No, don't ask to have four, five, six people. There's really not enough work even for three. You can do one. I'm just saying, you have to be technically part of a group. If you're a loner or you have other issues that force you to not work with other people, I shouldn't just say you're a loner. There might be other reasons why you can't work with other people. It's, you're, yeah. But preferred groups of three. When you work with at least two people, like if you work with someone else, there's a second set of eyes to check your work. So that's, you know, that's the catch there. At least you've got a second set of eyes to double check, make sure you're not losing, losing yourself in the work. And you'll submit two diagrams. Excuse me. You'll submit a conceptual diagram, which I talked about last week. And you can use whatever tools you want to diagram it. You can do it on paper. As long as I can read your handwriting and you take a picture, I'm okay with that. You want to use something. There's a website called EMD Plus. Literally made for making conceptual diagrams. It's got every symbol you'd ever want. Wording's a little weird on the site, but it works. You could use draw.io. You could use Visio. I've seen someone do it in Word. ERDplus.com. Yeah. Entity Relation Diagram Plus.com. And you can create a free account. It's free to use. And it exports as PNGs, if I remember right. So that's that first diagram. Second one is a physical diagram. I skipped the logical one because the difference between a logical and a physical, as I already said, is one has data types, one does not. Therefore, I'm going to waste, I'm not going to make you guys waste your time creating a logical diagram for me. There once was a time where I did, and I decided it was a waste of time for everyone. I had to grade it, and you guys had to make it, so I'd got rid of it. <laughs> okay, so the physical diagram, give it to me as a PNG. As some of you have noticed, when I've been grading Brightspace recently, especially the diagrams, I'm actually able to circle what you've done wrong. This is a new feature we just got, it's amazing. I can actually draw right on your submissions and actually show you where things were wrong so that my comments make actually make sense. As opposed to, you know, on table this, you did this, and you did that. No, instead, I could have like three red circles and say, you know, this is wrong. It saves time for me and it's more visual for you guys. If anybody submits a DBM file, an actual native PG Modeler file, I'm taking a point off because you're wasting my time. And Therefore, it sounds like a threat, but it is a threat. Don't waste Dan's time. Dan doesn't have a lot of free time. So export as a PNG. Lab four, you did it twice. Lab one, you did it once. Lab two, you did it once. You've done it three or four times now. You should be able to cope with that. Okay, so the premise is there's a local pizza shop that doesn't like its current database and it wants you to make, your new, make them a new one. And yes, it's a picture of a real pizza that I ate. Oh, you think I'm joking? Hello? What the heck? Oh, God, I hate Brightspace. It's actually putting me in editing mode every single time I click on a link. Okay, here's the menu. It's a real pizza shop. Best pizza in the West. Literally in the West End. Not kidding. They're just up over on Cobden Road by Iris. And I've got a copy of his menu for you guys to enjoy. The front of the menu, the back of the menu, and a receipt of a pizza order I did once. I just blacked out my cell phone number so you can't call me. I made, I made that mistake once. 
<laughs> had to get a new number. <laughs> so I've provided you with three pieces of data. And what you're going to do is you're going to diagram a structure that allows you to, con con to track orders and menu items. Anybody here ever work for in the food industry? OK, good. Any of you were waiters or waitresses? OK, you've seen the, the, the entry system over zeros all on paper. Yeah, the piece of shit, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, but there's certain ways where certain things are tracked a certain way, right? You start an order, you, you add the items they wanted, then customizations for whatever order they wanted, stuff or notes, depending on how the system's made. And yeah, but they still work. Don't change what's not broken. Um, so you're going to take those pieces of information and you're going to create the two diagrams for me. And the conceptual diagram will have all the major pieces and how they're related. I don't want the attributes. I literally want the entities and the relationships between them. If you want to do with the crow's foot notation just to make sure it's extra clear, that's OK. Um, but I mean, you should realistically have something that's a bit like My squares are so awesome. Pizza's covered in toppings. Okay. No, that's not actually valid for the assignment, by the way. If, you, if it looks exactly like that, you did something wrong. But I'm using that as an example of entity, relationship, entity. That's a conceptual diagram, 101. Literally, that's all there is to it, except you're going to be applying it to the specific one. I even give you guys some basic hints in there. There's products, there's product options, orders, order items. And this assignment is impossible to do in less than seven tables or seven entities. It's impossible to do in under seven. Just so you know, if you have less than seven, you're missing something. OK, now. I'm going to go over the grading thing, and I'm going to give you guys a big hint that I never, I never gave my students this summer, because this is the second time I'm using this assignment. And my summer students, a couple, a couple groups had problems, and I'll give you guys a big hint on what not to do. First, I'll go through the points. It's out of 30. So I don't make these stupid assignments out of like 120 points out of 100 points, because it's a big number that doesn't mean anything. The way it works is as follows. A conceptual ERD is worth five points. So this guy is only worth five points. Why? Because it's simple. Not simple as easy to do, simple as in there's not a lot of moving pieces to it. Does it show all the important entities? So are all the major pieces there? And does it show how they're all connected? It's worth five points. Congratulations. The physical ERD, which is the physical diagram like you guys have been doing in PG Modeler. That's worth 20 points. That's where the meat and potatoes of it are. And did you create all the tables and the columns? That's worth five points. I take off half a point for every mistake. So theoretically, it's possible to. It's rare that it, it's only, when somebody makes a mistake, it's rare it's only half a point, by the way. Often, it's more than half. Usually, the mistake happens in more than one place. Um, did you select appropriate data types? You guys have been through two diagramming exercises so far. Lab four makes you actually think about the data types a little bit. Um, I spoke about data types last week, so you should be able to guess at the appropriate data types. Um, for example, if you say topping name and you, you set it as an integer, that's you know half a point gone. I don't know how you're supposed to type pepperoni into an integer, but you know that doesn't work. So that's what I mean by appropriate data types. Um, if you make everything a varchar, that's still wrong too, because how can you track prices and do math on strings? It's not how that works, unless it's JavaScript, because then it, all the types are the same. Are naming conventions being followed? I talked about them at the end of lecture two. I've also put them at the end of the assignment. Um, are all the d relationships defined properly? Are your relationships all going in the right direction? Are they backwards? Are you using a bunch of one-to-ones? I can guarantee there's no one-to-one -one relationships in any of this. So they're all one-to-many, and are they going in the right direction? Again, five points. 
Now I've got a section called Application Database Design Theory for five points. Uh, these are my fuzzy spots where it allows me to, you know, adjust the grade up and down because sometimes somebody will come up with a really good idea but not do it quite right. And sometimes people have, are missing something. So did you cover all the basics? In other words, do you actually have all the tables and all the functionality that when you look at the menu, are you able to cover all the bases there? Um, you know, is everything interrelated properly? Did you miss anything major? I mean, uh, if you're missing some little piece of fluff, I probably won't care if you got most of it right. That's called revisions later. Um, and then is the database design properly normalized? Um, in other words, is there, um, are you repeating data in more than one place? The same kind of information in more than one place. I'll probably take points off if you're repeating the same thing in more than one place. Um, naming conventions are listed there. I've been through them. Basically, if you look at the ThinkCube database, there you have an example. If you look at the sample from Lab 2, there it is again. That's what they should look like. <laughs> so follow those rules and you'll do fine. Now, to give you guys, here's the big hint where people have a hard time. They get tripped up on it. So I'll ask everybody a question first. What's the difference between pizza, hamburger, and a sub? No. There's no difference. The answer is there is no difference. It's food. Somebody who's worked in a restaurant with a POS knows it's all food. It's all the same thing. What's the difference between, you know, you order a pizza with three toppings, you go to chances are and order a steak medium rare with fries instead of mashed potatoes and gravy. There's no difference. It's all the same thing. So what happens is a lot of people get lost in the weeds over what a lot of the stuff has. Like if you look at a pizza, a pizza is a round thing, maybe square, has sauce and cheese, that's a pizza. Then you put toppings on it, those are options. So you got a piece of food with options. If we look at a sub, you got a piece of bread with perhaps meat and or something non-meat and toppings. Pizzas have sizes, small, medium, large, extra large. A sub comes in half size, full size. So subs have sizes, fries have sizes, poutines have sizes, pizzas have sizes. Some stuff doesn't have sizes, so people get confused. Well, well, there's no size for this. Should I put it as a different thing? No, it's still food. Size is just an option. Uh, it's a bit like some restaurants where they offer half sizes or three quarter sizes for seniors. Oh, I want the fish and chips, but I only want one piece, not two. Boop, boop, that's just an option. Seniors, fish and chips. Or I want the kids, the kids hot dogs, whatever. It's all the same thing. Food is food is food. So now most English speaking people have heard the expression losing the forest for the trees. And for those of you that haven't heard that expression means you're focusing on the details so much you're not seeing the big picture. And what happens is when people see this much information thrown at them, they start focusing on the pasta, they start focusing on the subs, on the side orders, on the salads, but they don't even realize it realistically. What's the difference between a cheesy sub and a, and a Caesar salad? There is no difference. It's all food. Once you get over that hiccup, you'll have a much better time doing this assignment. Once you realize that don't worry about the details, you want to get down to the fundamental, most basic unit of information, which is food, food options. You have orders, order items, and the order items have options. Literally a list of six of the seven entities for you right there. So there you have it. So that's the assignment. So. Here comes the rest of the announcement. That's important for you guys. Next week is work periods all across the week. So there is no official lecture next week. I'll be here to help people that are stuck and or if you want to come through with me with a first draft saying, this is what we've come up with so far and I can tell you if you're right or if you're a tool. I won't say those exact words because you're new at this, but you know, I'll 
you'll be able to look at it and you'll be go, yeah, I'll tell you, yeah, you're in the right path. Why are you doing this? And yeah, you're focusing too much on the branches of the trees. You're even past the trees now. You're looking at the work. You're worried about what color the leaves are today. So I will tell you if you're in the right path and help point you in the right direction. Literally, that's all next week. So the labs, even though Lab 5 is technically assigned as of this week, it's not due next week. It's due the week after. And now, again, for the assignment, the due dates, which I didn't talk about. Okay. It started today. It's due on the 15th. I'm giving you guys two weeks to do this. It ends on the 22nd. Again, if you're over the 15th, you get a week grace period with a 10% penalty. I've actually had students hand in a crappy assignment and they showed it to me just before the due date and said, dude, you're going to fail because you didn't listen to me when I told you three times already that's not the right way. And they chose to take the 10% penalty and actually fix it because it was less of a hit than failing the assignment. Um, and honestly, I don't even mind if more than one work group discusses things because sometimes as a group, it, it helps to actually brainstorm as a whole. Not like a hole in the ground, as a whole, as an entirety. So, yeah, if people say, well, can we have more than three people in my group? No, but I don't mind if you guys compare ideas. As long as I don't get three submissions that are identical from three different groups, which is not cool, um, it shouldn't be an issue. Like when I ran it the summer, I had 32 groups and I literally had 31 different submissions that looked slightly different from each other. This is where you discover that database design is organic. So far, everybody talks about computer science this, computer science that, and how it's a technology and there's set rules until you start talking about data and information. It's the eye of the beholder. Whoever's looking at the data and decides what it's going to be structured like, every single person in here has different preconceptions of how data should look. And everybody has different assumptions and different biases. So even, even working in a group, you may start butting heads with a teammate. Why? Because you'll, you'll see it differently. At that point, you should have a conversation, right? Um, here's the other thing. Uh, if you get ghosted by your group members, collect proof. Uh, especially if they're doing it using Snapchat, take screenshots. Yes, they'll know you took screenshots, but now they've been warned. Uh, I've had cases where I had a student come up to me and say, nobody else in my group did anything. I did it all by myself. I was like, can you prove it? And he actually sent me the screenshots from Snapchat where the guy said, I'm bad. dude, I'm in the middle of playing COD, leave me alone. And the other guy said, and the other guy basically answered like 10 minutes before the assignment was due. He said, dude, sorry, I didn't get around to work too much. I was too busy doing insert here, which I really don't need to repeat out loud. And those two guys got zero. The other guy got full marks, but I can't give him extra marks for doing the whole job himself because well, I don't give more than 100%. But those guys got zero because they didn't participate and I had the documentation to prove it. So like I said, if you form a group and you discover you're, you know, you have this situation. If anybody recognizes Sir Grafo, you'll know exactly. But anyways, right? So we all appreciate this because we've all been in a group like that at least once in our lives. And if your group members go to you, prove it, and you, they will not get a grade unless they have counterproof showing that, you know, then I'll basically everybody sit, not sit down together because at that point there's usually issues. But... I'll, I'll collect proof from everyone and make an executive decision. If I can't make the decision, I, 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 I can't cut up the chain. Rarely I've had to go past me, but you know, it's happened once before too where both sets were proving each other wrong. <laughs> so I didn't know how to handle that. Um, so that's, that's the assignment. Now, okay, so before the break, I said I was going to give you guys, talk about some common data, data structures you'll see. When you're talking about certain kinds of data, there's some very common patterns that you'll see. And by patterns, I mean, when you define certain things, it's defined the same way, no matter where you are. And I always start with the first one being um, customer information and or 
uh, mailing information. So when you want to define a person, you have a person's name. Now, a person's name can be either left as a single piece, at that point you use like a really long Varkar field, or you want to break it down as the first name and the last name. This has some specific advantages um, because you are able to, when you search by first, holy cow, my handwriting is bad. There, that's a little better. If you need to find someone and you know their name, last name is uh, Joseph, you know, like that goalie, Curtis Joseph, years ago. And, but you want to just make sure you only find people whose last name is Joseph. If you have the name separated into pieces, you can search just through the last name for Joseph as opposed to if you look for Joseph, you might end up anywhere. You'd find anybody whose name is, you know, Joseph Bob versus Bob Joseph. So if when you, st it's usually more common to split the name into multiple pieces, unless it's a system where the names not, does, doesn't make a difference, where you're just using it to, as a label. Um, Again, you want to give yourselves a fair amount of space with a person's name. Uh, this, if you remember my little story about the email address, was it last week I said that story? About the insanely long email address? Um, it, you get people with insanely long names. So usually with a name, you want to give yourself at least, uh, you want to give yourself a Varkar 50. And that's if it's a, just a per, if you use the full name in one go. So if you just have like a name field where it's, you know, Dan Goudreau, give yourself 50. Um, if you're using splits, you could probably go down to 30. So Varkar 30 is usually enough to handle most North American names. Um, now, if you have to deal with countries where people have really long names, you have to take that into account. Spain, most, most of South America, Central America. Hispanic names are long. Poland, where they have more vowel consonants than vowels. You know, so depending on the names, the names can be very long. A lot of uh, Eastern European names are really long. Now, so that's when we talk about names, but the, the more important, interesting one though is address. And often when you'll see a database design, even earlier when you looked at uh, the uh, sample I did for uh, normalization where it had customer address and it only had a single field for the customer address. Honestly, that's what they call a, comp a um, composite field. It's a field made up of more than one piece of data. And when you normalize, you don't want that. So normally you want to break down an address into its component pieces. And what are the component pieces of an address? Well, first of all, you got the address, right? Which is the street address. And for 99% of people out there, right, uh, maybe 95% of the databases, you don't need to break it down like Canada Post does, you know, street number, street name, street type, that's excessive. Usually an address field that lets you type in, you know, one, two, three, some street is good enough. Often you'll have an address too. And what would be the address to? Postal box, suite number, insert other thing here. You know, it could be like uh, rural road five, RR5 for, you know, people that live out in the sticks. After that, you have a city. Duh. And by the way, for the address you want, you give yourself, again, at least 50 maybe a little more. It doesn't hurt to give yourself a little extra space in case you have some really absurd address. And if anybody's seen some of the addresses out of coming out of uh, cities in Quebec, you know, 5,000th West, Saint-Germain, Saint-Louis, you know, something else, like holy crap, Monte Saint-Germain. So give yourself on an address, you'll probably want to give yourself, you know, Minimum 50. That's supposed to be a 7. 75 is probably a better bet. 
So Verka 50, Verka 75, anything in there, you're good. City, often 40 is more than enough. So in there, you'll want a Varkar 40. Uh, again, unless you're dealing with absurdly long city names, but usually 40 is more than enough. Unless you're in England. Anybody here know anything about British addresses? Yeah, they are. They have, uh, a lot of addresses have two towns. Shropshire near Wilthashire. Literally, that's their address. They're telling you where the town is that's near this other town where the post office is. But that town doesn't have a post office. So it's near this other town. So in that case, you could either go city Varkar 100 to give yourself lots of room, or you could go city one, city two. That's really uncommon though, so usually you'll want to do city one, or just city, with minimum 40, but you could go as way up to 100 if you're dealing with the UK, because they're special that way. Now, the province, state, political division, insert here. Every country has a different version of this. I'm going to talk about those later. Because really, you shouldn't be including it with the address. You should be including something there, but not that. Which brings me to our happy little postal code. All right, postal codes. In Canada, how much room do you need for a postal code? Six or seven. Six if you don't include the space, seven if you include the space. I don't care either way. It's all good. Uh, if you're American, used to be five. By the way, in the States, they call it a zip code, but it's a postal code. They just want to be special. It used to be five. Nowadays, we need nine to 10. I think I explained that one also because the Americans ran out of postal codes. And they realized that their postal code system, you know, when you have one postal code for half of Manhattan, so you, you know, have three million people with the same postal code, it probably wasn't the best thought out plan. In other countries, it's only numbers. China, India, it's only numbers. Australia, they got five characters in their postal code because they have like no population. You know, you've got people, then you have death then you have people. There's a big circle of death in the middle. It's Australia. The only country that's actively trying to kill you. So for postal codes, if you're designing for a specific country, go with the that country. If you have to design internationally, give yourself lots of room. At least 10, maybe 12. And again, you end up having to have, you have to use a VAR car for postal code. So VAR car 12, specifically because, well, in Canada, we've got letters and numbers. India and China is just numbers. Australia is a mix of letters and numbers. England has six letters and numbers just like us, but they're, they're backwards. <coughs> kind of, but not quite. But it's pretty much the same system as us, but we wanted to be a little different, so we moved a letter around. But it's the same system. So, postal code VARCAR 12. And then we have country. I'm going to talk about country and provinces at the same time. Unless you have a really good reason, don't store the descriptive version of a province, state, political division, and or country in the customer's record, ever. Create a reference table. Remember, you guys, I've made, I've made you guys make reference tables multiple times now, and if you go and you pull up the ThinkCube database, you'll even see it in there, designed this way. Make country a separate table.
And that should be countries. Like that. And in here, you'd just store. Like that. In here, you'd have the foreign keys. Why? Because if a country changes name, which you know it doesn't happen in North America and Europe very often, but there are countries that change names. Like Myanmar has changed names three times in the last 15 years, flipping back and forth between two different names. Or if you have the case of Yugoslavia, where the, it was one country, now it's like five. You don't want to have to go and change the name of the country in every row. If you change the description in the reference table, if you change it in one place, and nothing else changes down here. So that's why you use the foreign key for this. So if you want a really good example of how an address should be defined, if you pull up the ThinkCube data, make the diagram, I had you guys do lab one and now playing in lab four, you'll actually see a properly defined customer record in there with all the bits and pieces you'd normally need. So that's an address. The next piece I like to talk about is phone numbers. Because you know what sucks harder than an address? It's a phone number. Okay, let's just start with North American phone numbers. How much space do you need to reserve for a phone number? Ten minimum. That's only if you're not storing any of the special characters, right? Special characters can be extracted at display time if you know for a fact what country it's for. Because phone numbers in Europe don't look like ours. They're a lot longer than ours, too. Because almost every phone number in Europe includes the country code. 044 for the UK. Then a bunch of numbers after that. Now, at a minimum, 10. Realistically, most people like storing the phone numbers formatted. Not necessarily the best plan, but people like storing it formatted. So if you're going to store it formatted, how much space do you need? Ten plus three is thirteen, right? Bracket, area code, bracket, exchange, dash, the next four digits. That's your thirteen characters. Some people will use, you know, area code dash, exchange, dash, phone number, and other people will use periods, you know, because everybody's got to be special. Usually that's the application developer's job to make sure they input it in a way that's sane. Don't break down the phone number into its component pieces unless you know for a fact it's only your database ever only going to contain North American data. I've seen people put in, you know, three fields, three, three, and four for the area code, the exchange, and your actual phone number. So when somebody talks about your phone number, really the all they're referring to is the last four digits, right? The rest of this is routing information how to get to your phone. Or it used to, care, used to count for something before everything got digital and does make a difference. Um, but yes, so for a phone number, at a minimum you want to have is 10. So a Varkar 10. And I often recommend 13 to 14. Unless you're dealing with internationals. Then you want 20 if you're dealing with international phone numbers. And that's really small, guys. Sorry at the back. Extra revision. Um, but yeah, so 10 minimum. So when you, for example, in your diagram for the assignment, if I see somebody put in phone number and they put in integer, I'll lose my shit. That's an invalid data type. Now, here's why. If you guys haven't learned SQL yet, but with SQL, you can pattern match. So you can look for parts of a string. So let's say I want to know everybody in 613. Okay. With a string, I can say, well, look at the first three characters, and that's all we're going to search against. Now, with an, when it's an integer, 
how are you going to figure out the 603 at the beginning because it's not a string? What are you going to do? You're going to take that integer, convert it to a string, and then do the match. Why not store it as a string to start with? Because all you're doing is making the searches slow. Or let's say you want to find somebody, everybody in a certain exchange. Now, nowadays, that's not that important. Um, and there's no one in here near my age, I don't think. For example, when I moved to Ottawa, I used to live on Carling. And when I moved to where I'm living now, I actually had to get a new phone number, even though I literally moved five minutes down the road, 10 minutes down the road. Why? Because the phone switches were literally physical switches where the, the area code in the exchange made a difference to where you lived. So the, six, the original 613, you know, 274 would actually route to a specific place in the city. And then you were connected to that block. And that's why when you used to move, your phone number would change. Nowadays, you can be sitting in Canada with a phone number from France and it'll work. Great way to get unlimited data on your phone plan. But the phone, the phone number floats. I mean, what, I went from Bell to Fido to Videotron on my cell phone. My phone number never changed. They don't care where I am never moved because the phone numbers are irrelevant for location. But if you are trying to find everybody in 613 so you can find everybody in the eastern Ontario, you'll care about being able to search through this as a string. So always store your phone numbers as a string, minimum 10. Then you may want to give yourself some extra room. And the other question I usually get at this point is what about the extension? You know, you call a phone number, then you got to punch in an extension. Do you store it as part of the phone number or do you store it as something else? Depends. The answer is depends. Normally, I store it as something else, as an extra field. So you'll have phone number, say Varkar 14, extension. Right nowadays, actually, I had to make it bigger recently, Varkar, like Varkar 8, usually for the extension. I mean, anybody here call uh, one of the government offices re recently? Their extension numbers are five digits long now. You call, you call the 800 number, then you push in a five-digit code to get into, it's like a pin now to get into an extension. And uh, apparently here at the college, we're up to five-digit extensions also. So give yourself room in the extensions, at least six digits. Honestly, if you're past six digits, you're practically punching in a second phone number anyways. So for the phone number, like I said, 10 to 14, if you want to store the extension, put in a second item. Um, the other item, uh, I like to bring up is if you have to discuss type in notes, like just like long pieces of stuff, use a text field. Um, that's a common pattern where you know often you have to take notes. For example, at a restaurant, special orders. Draw me a joke on the pizza box. That goes into the notes, not on the specific order. Or ring twice, knock twice, drop pizza. Money's under the f mat. You know, that's, a sad, that's another kind of instructions you might get. Uh, ignore the cat, he will not kill you. Um, you know, because some people are scared of cats. And that's, you know, that's basic to the common patterns, especially for the assignment that you'll need is, you know, for the phone numbers that, for the customer's information was what I described earlier. And that's the same for every system you, you create. That's the pattern of that data. Uh, as you start exploring, um, the world of the database more and more, you'll see certain patterns that come up all the time. So orders and order lines, invoices and invoice lines, they're all the same. Literally, every system has the same basic pieces. An order has an order number, it has a customer, it has a date. It has things you have in the order, which usually has like a product code of some sort and a price and a quantity. Every system has basically the same basic pieces. Um, there are a couple of websites that have example uh, sample databases that you can use. No, some of them aren't really well designed, but they at least give you a good idea what the structured data should look like. And when you look at it, you'll see common patterns between them. So um, that's literally all I was going to cover on this stuff. That was just you know useful for you guys to know. Other than that, um, assignment one, test one, lab four is due this week. You have what you need now to do lab five. So if you feel brave and you want to start on lab five right away, knock yourself out. It's literally not due for like weeks because of the assignment. It's, yeah, the lab's not due. Lab five is not due till the end, uh, the last, right? Like that's what's due just before the start of the break. So like 
two and a half weeks from now, lab five is due. Eh? Uh, no, the break is the week after Thanksgiving. You have Thanksgiving, four days of school. The week after is the break. Yeah. Uh, the 21st, the 25th is the break. Uh, no, Thanksgiving, yeah, it does include the weekend. Thanksgiving is the week before, so you get a short week the week before too. <laughs>